All right. Just stretch your hands to the Lord this morning. God, right now, God, we are grateful for your presence. We're grateful for all you've done. But we know you're not done yet. And so right now, we just ask you, Holy Spirit, stir up. Stir up in us the the soil. Stir up in us the desire. And God, today we don't come saying, oh, yeah, I'm so full. We come today and say, God, we got room for more. Show us more. Give us more. Because the challenge and the and the call in front of us is greater than anything we could ever even imagine. So give us more so we have more to give to this earth, to this dying world that needs Jesus. So today, God, we just begin right here, right at the beginning to say, God, you are worthy. You are holy. You're an awesome God. You are from the beginning and you will be there at the end. And there is no one greater than you. There is nothing more powerful than you. And today we come First and foremost, to honor you. Today, God, we come to honor you and we come to bless you. And God, we just thank you that as we come today, that you, as you're lifted up, will draw all people to you. Draw all people to you. Let's just, if you're filled with the Spirit, I want us just to pray in the Spirit for a minute. Come on, let's just pray and let's begin to stir up the Spirit of God within us. Let's begin to allow God to just fill us up, begin to till the soil of our hearts. We've had a lot come in, but this could be the moment right now, this session, could be the time when God stops everything for you and says, I have a word for you. Stops everything for you and says, I have a place I have a destiny. I have a purpose. I have an answer for you. So right now, God, we just begin to stir our spirit up. We stir our spirit up, God, and we ask that your presence would come. As we worship you, God, as we worship you, would you come and be among us? God, we just thank you for your presence today. Come on, let's just worship him. Come on, worship team. Let's just worship him in this place today. Oh, you're a holy God.
Let's just sing that one more time. I call. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord this morning. This is an acknowledgement of a God that is ever present. He's not a magical God that comes at our ever whim, but He's ever present. Come on, sing that to Him. I called and you answered. God, we just want to be where you are today. Come on, sometimes worship is a song, sometimes it's offering, sometimes it's words. Can we use our words to honor him today, to worship him? God, we just want to be where you are. We just want to be where you are. We just want to be in your presence, God. Doesn't matter if we're in our car, in our house, in the store. Doesn't matter if we're on the street, God. We just want to be where you are. Because where you are is fullness of joy. Where you are is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Where you are, God, is life. Come on, He's worthy this morning. God, you're worthy this morning. Sometimes it doesn't even take words. Sometimes just knowing that He's God, just knowing that He's God is enough. You're enough today, God. You're enough today, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can just keep playing. I'm going to ask y'all to have, just have a quick seat. You know, as we, as we come together as a body, there's something about unity. There's something about when we all come together and say, and say we're going to hear this word. We're going to hear from the Lord. We're going to... We're going to see what God is saying, and then we're going to move in that. And we're going to give here in just a second. But before we do, we've got all hell hates what we're, what's happening this weekend. We got uh, Pastor Mark had to go to the hospital. And, uh, I, you know, he doesn't need our text. He needs our prayers this morning. Pastor Dave has, has gotten sick, and so he's not able to come. But we got an amazing, and Pastor Lynn said, just gather everybody, and let's just pray. So can we just extend our hands to the Lord and say, God, we thank you that your healing power, God, your healing strength, you said you sent your word and healed them. So right now we send your word to Pastor Prophet Dave. We send your word to Pastor Mark. And we speak healing to their bodies in Jesus' name. We speak life to them in Jesus' name. And we serve notice on you today. The devil, you can come against, but we won't stop. We won't step back. We won't stop pushing because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Greater is he who is in us than anything that the enemy can bring against us. And so today, God, we stand. We stand in you. We stand in your authority. We stand in your power. And we declare healing to our brothers. We declare healing to our families. We declare healing, God, to our to our um, children and our youth. God, even now, as our youth are being ministered to in this back hallway, let it rain on them today, God. Let your presence fall on them today. Let your spirit move in such a way that we don't even get to go home because the young people are having such a revival. God, we pray today. You said if we make your request known unto, our request known unto you, God. <laughs> So we're coming because you're a great God. And we're still here, devil. You brought cancer against us. You brought sickness against us. You brought all kinds of stuff against us. But we're still here. We're
we're still here today. We're still here today. And we'll still be here tomorrow. We will still be here tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> What's the devil going to do with a bunch of people that say, do your best and I'm still going to be here? Do your worst, I'm still going to be here. Because greater is he in me than he who is in the world. Amen? You know, we, uh, we're supposed to take an offering. And uh, here's what I'd like to do. I know that Kevin's going to come and he's got an on-time word. But I'm just going to have him bring a bucket up front. There's nothing about this bucket. You know, it's, it looks like a popcorn bucket. There's nothing about that. But there is something about our worship. There's something about when we say, I'm going to sow. I'm going to give him my best to God today. Knowing that God gave up his best to me. We're going to take a minute, but after you give, I'm going to ask you to go back to your seat. And let's just for just a minute, before Prophet Kevin comes to give us a word, I'm going to ask you to just go back to your seat. Don't talk. Don't check your text messages. Just go back to your seat. Close your eyes and say, God, speak to me today. Can we just do that? Can we just get, get still before the Lord and allow him? And they're going to minister in song, but can we get still before the Lord? We, we have so much hype. And sometimes it says, he's just in a still small voice that says, it's going to be okay. I got this. I got this. Take those offerings and let's just present them to the Lord God. These are, it's your money. Everything we have, you've given us the ability to get. It's your power. It's your ability. So as we come and as we give of our best, God, would you be honored today? Would you meet us with a move of you today on a Saturday morning when the huge crowds are not here? Those who are here that are just saying, I'm going to come and get whatever I can get for as long as I can get it. Would you just show up in a crazy, amazing way today, God? Bless these seeds. Bless these homes that have given. You said, hold you to your word, and your word says if we give, you'll give back so we can give more. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Just come. Bring your offerings to the Lord. Then I'm going to ask you to come back and just close our eyes and begin to wait. Just wait on the Lord as they just minister to us. Just let us, let us just wait on the Lord this morning. got a video back here I want to set the atmosphere can you put that video on for me guys how many of you know that God will make a way for you Amen. come on God will make a way we're going to change the atmosphere I got a video I want to sing from a girl from Africa so they got some Africans in it. I don't know the Africans it's called Waymaker how many heard that song Waymaker All right I want you to get in that and realize that God has a way he's going to make for you it's not going to come by your intellect. It's going to come by the spirit. Go ahead and kick it in. Come on, turn it up loud.
worship you you are here working in this place i worship you i worship you you are here moving in a mist i worship you i worship you you are here working in this place i worship you i worship you hey we make a miracle walker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is Thank you so much. You can be seated. Come on, give God some praise in the house. Are you recording back there, Blake? Okay. Sometime you got to give God the sacrifice of praise. Your flesh don't want to, but your praise is moving things. Your praise is shifting things. Somebody say, my praise is a weapon. Come on, say, my praise is a weapon. You know, when you have supernatural experiences, you begin to see the power of prayer, the power of praise. It's not just something you're doing in the building. It's shifting things around you. 
Today I'm going to be talking about restoring religious soul damage. Restoring religious soul damage. Say, I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. And when you get born again, you get born of an incorruptible seed. Your spirit cannot be corrupted, but your soul can. Your soul can. And so that's why my spirit is the leader, not my soul. And many people are living out of their soul. Religion is from the soul. It's not from the spirit. Everybody say religion, religion. is from the, soul. from the soul. How many have ever had the teaching on soul ties? Where your soul can get tied to something. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotion, your intellect, your personality, your memories, your past experiences. All that's in your soul. And God expects your soul to be transformed. Everybody say, my soul can be transformed. Now, why is this so important? Your soul can shift. Your soul can shift. I can be an on-fire, dedicated disciple, and in next year, I can be a jerk. Why? Your soul got damaged. How do you understand that the first thing that God told Adam and Eve is don't eat from that tree but you can eat from every other tree. What was the name of that tree? The tree of the knowledge of what? And he said, the day that you eat from that tree, you will what? Die. Everybody say, Kevin. Kevin. Tell us what death is. Tell us what death is. Death is not having access to the Father's interpretation, the Father's investigation, the Father's impartation. That's death. Good will kill you. Second Corinthians said the letter of the law will produce death. How many know the Bible is good? But without God, it will kill you. Church without God will kill you. Amen. With an attitude, say church. church. Without God, without God. will kill you. kill you. How will it kill you? It separates you from the Father's interpretation. It separates you from the Father's investigation. It separates you from the Father's impartation, his life. And so the first word in that scripture where it says, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good, good will kill you. And religion is all about being good. Religion is not around following the Holy Ghost. Religion is about keeping good things. You know, years ago, I was at a church. Matter of fact, I was at an Assembly God church. And I had a bunch of sinners that were confessing their sin. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a fornicator. I was doing this. I was doing that. It was spontaneous. Have you ever been one of my meetings when that tell the truth that only comes? People just start confessing their sins like John the Baptist. They just start confessing their sins. It lasted about two hours. It's like they had the stomach flu. They just wanted to come. I need that microphone. I need to get this off of me. I need to get this out of me. And if you've never been in that, you need to be in that. It's a purging. You just, I got to get it out of me. And the pastor's daughter says, can I say something? She was a virgin. She was a church girl. She was obedient. But she said, when she took the microphone, she says, I, I almost wanted to be a sinner. I wanted to do bad things. You know why? Because she wanted her father's attention. Because she said, my daddy gives all the attention to the bad people. You know about that. And it's like the worse you are, the more attention you get. And she was daddy hungry. But she was the good girl. And here's the problem with being good. Good is not a personality. 
Good is not a person. Good is not a character. It's a bunch of attributes that are disconnected from who you are. Anybody ever seen people get a personality and they try to be somebody else and they just lose who they are? Or somebody gets a facelift and you can't recognize them anymore? They look good but don't look like you. Now, I'm not against facelifts. If you need one, save up money. <laughs> I was in Colombia. Colombia is the uh, South American capital of uh, cosmetic surgery. But sometimes it's too much. I had this one pastor's wife, she got breast augmentation, and it was too much. Too much. Too much. Somebody say, too much. too much. Well, how do you know it was too much? Her breast came in the room 30 seconds before the rest of her did. It was too much. <laughs> too much, too much, too much. But she was trying to enhance herself by something on the outside. Everybody say, God, God does, not want you does not want you to be good. To be good. Now, some of you is like, you can't say that. But I just read the scripture. Death is in being good. Everybody say death is in being good. You see, the devil's in the substitutes. The word antichrist really means a substitute for. The antichrist is a substitute for the Christ. We know that as a person. But in, in nature and in function, antichrist is when you give God a substitute for what he asked for. He wants a son. He wants a daughter. He doesn't want a good actor. And so here's the problem when you're around that kind of lifestyle. It damages your soul, not from evil, but from doing good. In the last several years, God has put me on this rampage to take good out of the church. Why? It's killing the church. How was church? It was good. Did God show up? No, but it was good. How was the worship? It was good. Nobody sang off tune, but God wasn't in it. Listen, I'm going to ask you a question, and this is your answer. I'm giving you the answer ahead of time. Open book test. Your answer is transferring life. You got it? What is ministry? Life. What is prophecy? Life. What is teaching? Life. What's laying on of hands? What's real fellowship? Life. Goodness doesn't have any life to transfer. Goodness has no life to transfer. And so if I'm around good all the time, I can be totally empty of life. Well, I've been going to church all these years. How do you feel? Empty. I've been a good girl. I did everything my daddy said. Empty. See, when you read the story of the prodigal son and the older brother... Most of the time, they preach the most time on the prodigal, pig boy, sin, evil. He ate from the evil side of the tree. But the older brother, he ate from the good side of the tree. He was just as evil and disconnected from the father as the pig boy. Ooh, somebody getting hit in the head with a theological brick. Come on. And the, the Pharisees love to preach about the prodigal. He, look at him, he spent all his money with prostitutes and drugs and he's a crack whore out there. And, oh, he's bad. And when the prodigal came back, he said, I have done all these things, Father. I've been the good son. I've never asked you for anything. That tells me he never had a real relationship that was based on friendship and fellowship. It was based on goodness. Look at your neighbor and say, God doesn't want you to be good. Come on, say, God does not want you to be good. Well, Kevin, what does he want? He wants you to be a son and daughter led by the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says, And as many as are led by the Spirit. That means you're going to hear His voice. You're led by the Spirit. 
You are the sons and daughters of God. You know that God has these incredible metaphors in the Bible. We're the bride, we're the army, we're the garden, we're the house. But the most dominant metaphor is son and daughter. The highest calling is not something you do. It's something that you are. And when Jesus was speaking on the mount where he was speaking the Beatitudes, it's contrasted between the mountain that Moses spoke on, which is Mount Sinai, which was laws to make you obey and be good. Now, God never wanted that to be the outcome that you only saw the law and did good. But Moses' law was about doing something. The attitude of the Beatitudes was about becoming something. You can't do mercy unless mercy is inside of you. He was talking about transformation of the person. And that's why Jesus shocked him. Now, here's why this is so important. Everybody shout shalom. Shalom. With an attitude, shalom. Shalom. Now, we know that shalom means blessing and goodness and so on and so forth. But there are three aspects of shalom I want you to hear. You can write these down. Number one, when you have shalom or peace of God in your life, there's a metaphor. It's my foot on the enemy's neck. That's a word picture. Hebrew is a picture language. My foot on the enemy's neck. Every nerve goes to the neck and every nerve goes to your foot. It means all of me is on top of all of the devil. He can't talk. The voice of the accuser is silenced. Everybody say the voice of the accuser is silenced. The second thing shalom happens is nothing's going to be broken. Matter of fact, guess where we're going to live one day? New Jerusalem. And that can start happening right here. So my foot on the enemy's neck, number two, nothing's going to be broken. Anything broken in you, God will repair it. But here is the one that I've been emphasizing a lot. Nothing missing. Nothing missing. Everybody say you can't fix missing. You can't fix it. It's not broken. It's not there. And so here's the problem. You're so busy being good, you've missed the things that give you life in relationship. You didn't have those conversations of a father and a daughter that were reality-based. It was always based on following instructions but never about who you were as a person. You're being good. I'm the good daughter. I'm the good son. I don't do bad things. But the problem, we weren't made for good. We were made for life. And religion is a series of rules designed to keep you good. Is anybody hearing this yet? Religion is a design of rules and formulas To make you good. And that was the initial deception of the garden. If I'm good, I'll be good enough. If I do enough good things, I'm accepted by the Father. If I do enough good things, God is obligated to bless me. If I do enough good things, my life is going to be blessed and good. Going to turn out right. And then what happens is you live life. You play by the rules. And all of a sudden you find you're divorced, you're bankrupt, your church splits, you're schizophrenic on the inside, I'm bipolar. What the heck happened to me? You, my friend, whether you went to church or not, you have religious soul damage or formulistic soul damage. It's the same thing. Religion is a bunch of formulas. Here's what happens. If I'm living my life for good, I'm not living my life for lordship. I'm not following the Lord. And so what drove the Pharisees nuts is that when Jesus would break their rules, and then God would show up. They were furious. They were so legalistic about the rules. 
You can't work on the Sabbath. You couldn't pick up anything. You can't. And Jesus said, let me ask you a question. If your donkey falls into a pit, can you get your donkey out of the pit on the Sabbath? They say, yes, it's an emergency. So what's better, getting a donkey out of a pit or getting a man healed on the Sabbath? And they didn't know what to say. And so this guy who is infirm, Jesus says, be healed. And he picked up his bed and began to walk with his bed. And they were furious. Now here's why. Oh my God. Some of you in this room, you are this message. You see, when you are doing good for years, you have a religious bank account on the inside of you. I've got so much time. I got so much effort. I got so many meetings. I paid my dues. I'm invested in the religious system. I'm a member in good standing. And for you to come and tell me, it don't take all that. Oh, no, no, no. See, that's what Jesus did. He says, you guys have been wasting God's time and the people's time. You are being good, but you're not being God. And let me just tell you this. When you have a big religious bank account with all your good works and meetings you've been to and everything else. When somebody comes along and they say, God doesn't want you to be good. Oh, you mad as hell. Man, I've done all this. I said all this. I got the big lady hat. I went to the conference. I got the card. Oh, and now you say, it don't take all that. Every one time I was preaching in a Panamanian church in Brooklyn. And it was like 110 degrees in this church building. Had a real low ceiling. All these people from the Caribbean and they were expressive in worship. It was horribly hot. And I wore a suit because that was a uniform for that denomination. I had to wear a suit. And so I took off my tie because, man, I was boiling up, man. It was just like people were fainting. It was so hot. And so I go to the pulpit, and the pastor, the head pastor was from Panama, sends a note to the usher. It says, man of God, do not disrespect my pulpit. Put your tie on. That had nothing to do with people getting healed, saved, and delivered. That was how he perceived church. We have in church. And everything about Jubilee is anti that. Everything about Jubilee is in the DNA is anti that. Now, why am I saying this to you? We're going to get religious refugees by the hundreds if we do our job right. Somebody say religious refugees. Religious I'm escaping from a religious system. They know how to be good. They know they're not supposed to be bad, but they do not know how to flow in the spirit. And when they first come, when refugees first come, they're not acclimated to how the thing works. And so I want you to understand, we don't have a different sin in its consequences. We got the same kind today. It just masquerades, it looks different. Everybody say, God does not want me to be good. You know, I was around the Word of Faith movement for a number of years because I lived in Tulsa. And it's a movement that was a real movement of God. But there is something about when God really moves, human nature likes formulas. And if you ever come to me and say, Kevin, what do you think about this? And you ask me a question. If you frame your question that provokes me and designs me to have to give you a formula as a response, I will not talk to you. Everybody say formulas can't fix you. Say formulas can't fix you. Idealism is the close cousin to legalism. Idealism is the close cousin to legalism. 
because it's idealistic, formulistic. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he says, what things must I do to be saved? He missed the whole point. How many understand that you can't do enough to be a good son? You can't do enough to be a good daughter. It's not in the doing, it's in the being. It's not in the doing, it's in the being. God does not want religious robots. I remember I was with Pastor Ballinger probably 25 years ago. We went on a mission trip to Argentina. And if this is your persuasion and your religious background, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm trying to tell my story. And if you get offended, it's on you. Everybody say, what offends you reveals you. And so Pastor Ballinger had been like second generation or third generation assemblies of God. Everybody say, assemblies of God. Come on, say, assemblies of God. And there's different kind of denominations, but here's the problem with denominations. They start off good, but then they become exclusive. We are the move of God on the earth. We have the monopoly. If God's going to do it, it's going to happen through us. And then God flips the script and he gives it to somebody else, a nobody who's not been good. And so Pastor Pastor started down there, because I've always been kind of me. I, I've never fit in a form. I got saved from being a Catholic, and then I found Jesus, and I found Jesus wasn't Catholic, and Mary wasn't a virgin, and that changed everything for me. <laughs> Everybody say, Jesus is not Catholic. Jesus is not Catholic. And Mary's not a virgin. Mary's not a virgin. That changed everything for me. Because I was told all these years Mary's a virgin. Then I read in the Bible she had six kids, had names, plus Jesus. Man, she had a big family, at least seven kids. We don't know how many girls there were. It says, and sisters. Four brothers and sisters. Because I always thought Jesus was a Catholic. I began to read the Bible. Man, he wasn't a Catholic. Changed my philosophy. So we're down in Argentina, and we went to a bunch of Assemblies of God churches in Argentina. I'll never forget Pastor Ballinger's face when he walked in at me. He went, ah. Why? They look the same except brown, and that's it. They spoke a different language, but they combed their hair the same. They walked the same. Their voice inflection was the same. They said hallelujah the same. They went, God bless you the same. Their body posture. He said, he said, my God, this is a spirit. And even though he had been out of it, he recognized it. Why? Because we're all trying to be good the same formulistic way. I remember years ago when uh, Pastor Kenneth Hagan Sr. was alive. He was from West Texas, had this very distinctive voice, but he had a way of walking. It was kind of like a duck walk. He walked like a duck. He, walked, he would go side to side when he was preaching. And he said, well now, praise the Lord. For the Lord was saying to me. And he would twiddle his thumbs when he would preach. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Glory to God. And some of you are hearing it already. When you went to one of his meetings, 25-year-old kids walking like they had hemorrhoids waddling back and forth. Glory to God. Praise God. If he bought a brand new coat, I remember he had an ultra suede coat, kind of a golf looking coat. It was like mauve and kind of a kind of a soft color. And there was a guy in the mall that sold them. He sold hundreds of them because Brother Hagen had one. They were trying to emulate. Everybody say, God don't want you to be good. People say to me, say, Kevin, will you lay hands on me for your anointing? I say, no. Why? Number one, I'm still using it. <laughs> it's working pretty good. I'm still using it. <laughs> Number two, if I transferred you my anointing, you'd have to have my memory banks, my demons, my wife, my kids, my assignment wouldn't work for you. Number three, if I gave you my anointing, 
you'd stop trying to find and develop yours. And see, my anointing won't fit you. You got to have my sarcastic sense of humor. Somebody say sanctified sarcasm. Come on, say sanctified sarcasm. When I first got saved, I started witnessing in this old religious formalistic preacher. Now, you can be saved and formalistic. You just won't be happy. I said, you can be saved and formalistic. You just won't be happy. He says, a young, I was about 23, he said, young man, the gospel is not a funny business. He says, you can't tell those kind of funny jokes when you share the gospel. It's serious business. And so, one thing I learned early in life, I read the scripture where it says, Abba, Father. So no matter what you say, because I have been deceived by the Catholic Church for so long with Mary was a virgin and she was blue eyes and she was a beauty queen from Scandinavia, so on and so forth. <laughs> You've seen the pictures. She had a gorgeous body, blue eyes. My God, she's 14 years old, little brown girl from Palestine. But they have her looking like the Swedish beauty queen, Miss Universe. I said, no, I'm checking everything with the word. I need proof from the Bible, man. He said, no, you can't. This is the gospel of serious business. You can't tell funny things when you preach the gospel of serious business. So I went back to Lord. I said, Lord, I said, this guy told me I couldn't tell jokes when I preach. That I couldn't be sarcastic. What do you think? And I heard the Lord laugh. <laughs> I invented humor, son. He said, I have no problem with sarcasm as long as it's sanctified sarcasm. <laughs> Somebody say sanctified car sarcasm. Come on, say sanctified sarcasm. You see it in the Bible all over the place. He gave James and John nicknamed Sons of Thunder. That's sarcastic. Noise without lightning. Thunder, no power. You remember when Elijah's on the mountain, he says, is your God in the bathroom? That's sarcasm. I came back, I said, no, you're not going to twist me. He was trying to form me in a humanistic mode. And when you come out of that severe goodness, that severe rule keeping, you're lost. Because you don't know who you are. You know what to do. But you don't know who you are. And when you say, I don't want to be good anymore, I want to be led by the Spirit. You know, my wife was raised super strict, assemblies of God, no makeup. No earrings, you couldn't cut your hair, dresses down to your ankles, blouses up to your neck. I mean, it was like severe. And so she got delivered from that pretty much. <laughs> Somebody say pretty much. Pretty much. You know, she couldn't wear jewelry. And if you see my wife now when she walks in the church, you know she's wearing the devil's revenge. I, Look at this devil. <laughs> Back at you, devil. Bling, 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 bling. <laughs> got bling on every finger. Pay, got her toes painted, haircut, everything. Because she was told that's not being good. It's worldly. This, if you want to be good with God, you got to do all these rules. And my middle son, when he was 14, 15 years old, his older brother found some of my old clippers. I was, a, I was a barber for about nine months. Couldn't handle it. <laughs> Hated it. I was a barber in 1969. I graduated barber school in 1968. I became a barber in 1969. Students of history, do you know what happened to hair in 1969? <laughs> the white people had it dragging down the rear end. The black people had giant basketballs on their head. Nobody cut their hair. 
I said, this is a bad career move right here, Jesus. <laughs> and so my oldest son found some of my clippers, and my son had, my middle son had great hair. He has dark black hair and wavy and thick. And so my wife went shopping, and I don't know where I was. And he took his brother in the garage and he gave him a mohawk. How many know what a mohawk is? It's when you shave this side and you have like this chicken comb on the top of your hair. And he had it all greased up and he had, it, had moose in it. And he came and I said, hey dad, what do you think? It's not what I think. It's what your mama's going to think when she gets home. <laughs> and so out of her religious formulistic memory banks, all she could think about when she saw that here was drugs, rock and roll, bar fights, motorcycle gangs. Because that's pretty much the kind of people who had that kind of haircut. So when she comes back down, she goes, ah, she was just distraught. She was distraught. And so she had a religious flashback. And I said, hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. All she could see was drugs and rock and roll and motorcycle gangs and rebellion and fornication because that one with the haircut in her brain. He's 14. I said, sit down, honey, sit down, honey. Let me ask you a question. Is that haircut illegal? No. Is it unbiblical? No. Is it unethical? No. Is it immoral? No, but it's ugly. I said, darling, ugly is not a sin. Look at your neighbor and say, aren't you glad ugly is not a sin? Aren't you glad ugly is not a sin? How many understand style changes? How many of you got some stuff in your closet that are over 50 that you would never be seen in public with that ever again. Got them giant bell bottoms and some of the wild colors and those collars that they could fly. If the wind came right, you could, get, you could attain altitude. <laughs> you know, you get no, one of my, my grandsons came to me and he said, he said, Grandpa, have you got any clothes I can wear? I said, for what? He said, we're having a costume party. You know you're old when you're using your old clothes for costumes. <laughs> if it's not illegal, if it's not immoral, if it's not unethical, if it's not unbiblical, and you forbid it, it's religion. If it's not illegal, if it's not immoral, if it's not unethical, if it's not unbiblical, and you forbid it, it's formalism or religion. Now, to get along with the folks, sometimes you got to kind of go along with some of their stuff. But on the inside, you can say, this is crazy. I'm just doing it to avoid a fight. But don't think I'm going to surrender this. This is crazy. Now, here's what happens. When you have dominant people in any sphere of life, they have preferences Somebody say, I have preferences. I have preferences. Say, I have preferences. I have preferences. But don't make your preference somebody else's prophecy. That's my preference. I choose not to have tattoos. That's a personal preference. Why? Because skin is a very unstable thing to use as a writing instrument. See, when you are 21, body's firm, muscle tone, look at that eagle on your arm. But when you're 65 with age and liver spots on your skin, it's a vulture. <laughs> it's a dinosaur. So I made a personal decision. Tattoos are not for me. I foresaw my skin future. I said, that's not going to look on skin that's 40 years old. 50 years old. So I said, no, no, no. But I see people's tattoos. Oh, Lord. I go to Brazil. 
Brazil is the land of the bad tattoos. Can I practice on your skin? No. But I can't forbid it. It's my preference, but I can't make it your prophecy. And some of you are going to get delivered in the next three days because God is going to have you relook at your life if it's not illegal, if it's not unbiblical, if it's not immoral, if it's not unethical, and somebody has forbidden it. You were under religion. And the thing about religious people is that they don't see the way God sees, and they usually have a really, really hard time with mercy. Hard to legislate mercy. It's hard to legislate mercy. Easy to regulate. It's easy to do rules. Hard to do mercy. Mercy is something that has to come from the Spirit of God. Mercy doesn't come from the human man. Because we want people to keep our rules. And so what happens when you're under a lot of rules and they're unfair, but you can't go to the Bible and say, this is it. It's kind of in the atmosphere. Many times you get mean and angry and mad. You know, the older brother had a problem with anger. Religious people, when you challenge their religious bank account and all the things they've done and say that's not necessary, they get angry. They get angry because they're defending the life of keeping the rules. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. Paul made a decision, I'm deleting my religious bank account for Jesus. He said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I excelled past my my superiors, I sur surpassed all the people in my generation. He did all the rules. He said, but all the things that were in my religious bank account, today I delete my account that I may follow Jesus. Today God is saying, I need you to delete your formalistic and religious bank accounts. That's why people get stuck in the spirit. That's why they get stuck in time. You know, I'm 70 years old in just a couple of months. And I'm about to do something new for God. What is it? I don't know. How's it going to work? I don't know. Where are you going to go? I don't know. I'm following him. And I know I got to leave some stuff that I've been successful in the past. I got to leave it in the past because it can't go with me into the future. Is anybody hearing me? And the inability to walk away from your religious bank account, your formalistic bank account, or even your past successes. That's exactly what Israel tried to do. They tried to maintain the status quo. And one of the parables that Jesus gave in the Bible, it was a real thing that happened, but it was parabolic. How many understand the word manna, what manna means? Everybody say manna. When the children of Israel came in the wilderness, in the desert, they had this manna, this bread come from heaven. It's called the bread of heaven. But the word manna means, what is it? What does manna mean? What does manna mean? And if you did not gather it, it melted. When the sun came up, it melted. On Friday, you got to take a double portion, and it was good until the Sunday because you had to rest on the Sabbath. But if you tried to gather more, it would stink and have worms. You know what religion is? Stinking manna. It was good for what God did back there, but it's of no importance for what God is doing right now. It's religious. And once you get acclimated to spirit, religion smells bad. You see worms everywhere. Oh, man. And that's how Jesus was because it traps you from knowing the Father. Now, let me just say that many religious systems are mixture. It's not all bad. 
but it definitely has contamination in it. Everybody say the word Babylon. Babylon. Say Babylon. Babylon. The word Babylon means confusion by mixture. Now, I've been a Christian a long time, and I've seen a lot of bad things happen through the church. I was with a church a couple of weeks ago, and I had a lady like 53 years old. Her dad was a bishop in a black denomination. Everybody say, bishop. bishop. Come on, say, bishop. bishop. Some bishops, they're so carnal, they need to baptize them in dirty water and anoint them with baby oil. Sheesh. Please get delivered. Well, his daughter got pregnant at 16 or 14, 15, and the father wouldn't talk to her for a year. And she was so hurt. Her father, her own father, wouldn't talk to her for a year. Why? She broke the rules. She broke the rules. And he could not show mercy because mercy comes from the spirit, not from formulas. That was the big problem with the older brother. He could not show his younger brother mercy because he was a rule keeper. And when you get this revelation, I haven't been following Jesus most of my life. I've been following good. I've been doing good. Here God take all my good works. Now here's the thing. You are going to work, but by the Spirit. When you receive a, a blessing from God and you have access to God's presence, He will give you prophetic instructions. Somebody say prophetic instructions. But religion operates on legalistic instructions. Well, to do this and to do that, this is how you do it. And, you know, sometimes I go to a lot of, I used to go to a lot of inner city black churches. I love, I'm 42% I'm, I'm black. I got my Ancestry.com done. Had one pastor say, Kevin, you're not black enough to preach that message. I said, well, how black you got to be? Jesus wasn't black and he preached it. But I knew they were all fussed up by religion and hurts and offenses. So I got my Ancestry.com done. I'm 42% from Ghana and Benin. I can't give you 100% black, but I'll give you 42%. <laughs> and with a prophetic anointing, it'll get the job done. <laughs> but some of those black churches, they're so formalistic. Everything is planned. The deacon gets up and sings, Oh, me, you can't sing. He won't be there till they carry him out of the church dead. It's my spot. That's religion. There's no life in it. It may have been what God has said, but it's not what God is saying. And God has no problem getting rid of something that's obsolete. It was good back then. You know, Jesus only did one miracle with spit and mud. But religious folks, they would take it on the road, buddy. <laughs> you bring the mud. Come on. We're having a miracle meeting. You bring the dirt, I'll bring the spit, and God will do a miracle. <laughs> now, it's funny, but that's how religion does. They don't check it with God, but they presuppose if I do these six things, I'll get an answer. Now, here's the problem. Being good is part of our human nature. We would like to relate to people on our goodness than on coming to them as we are. Adam and Eve wanted to give God goodness. God wanted them. And there are many of you in this room today. You've been under goodness. You're a rule keeper. You're legalistic, idealistic. Everything has to be perfect. Somebody shout, perfect, perfect. is not possible. Perfect, perfect. Is, not possible. is not possible. I had a question just before I came in this session. Is it, Kevin, I, I'm afraid to go full blast for the Lord because I don't want to get in pride. 
That's a rule keeper attitude. Tell me exactly how far I can go so I don't get into pride. Pride is not something you can measure with a list. It's a spirit. It's an attitude. You can't measure pride by, well, you did that. That's pride. It's something that's subjective. It's a heart attitude. It's a motivation. It's an intention. You know, I never worry about getting in pride. I never worry about it. Why? The Lord's the only one that can tell me I'm proud because he sees my heart. Well, Kevin, you're arrogant. No, I'm not. Well, you just this way had a, had a pastor one time. He said, when I first met Kevin, I, he was just so arrogant to me. He walked in the room and he had his shoulders all back like this. And he told me that. He says, I thought you were the most arrogant. He said, you think you're the only rooster in the hen house, don't you? Huh? That's what he told me. Now, he's a good friend of mine now, 25 years. He says, you think you're the only rooster in the hen house? I says, brother, I had a back problem at that time. I said, I was trying to keep my back up because I had a lot of pain. He goes, sorry. But he was judging me out of what was inside of him. And so God wants to deliver you from being good. That's such an oxymoron that some of you can't even. God wants to deliver me from being good? See, the problem is I'm so busy being good, I miss the conversations and the interactions to make me a son. The older brother was so busy being good. And he gave father his goodness rather than his fellowship. And he measured the relationship by what he didn't have. He had his father. He said, son, you were always with me, but you didn't take advantage of it because you were too busy being good. And there's some of you in this room today, you're wondering why God has put a wall around you and not let you progress further. Because if God gave you the success you want, you would corrupt it by goodness. Somebody say corrupted by goodness. This is the big thing with God. You know what fellowship is? The word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. And this is the highest good that we could ever attain to in God. It's the highest place of life. God told Adam and Eve, it's not good for mankind to be alone, not just men. Because if you've been married a long time, sometime it's good to be alone from your wife. <laughs> About every 27 days when they're done, they go through their cycle. I'm getting out of here. I'm going deer hunting. I'm going to do something, play checkers. I got to get out of here. He wasn't talking about marriage. He was talking about family. Here's what communion means. And this is what every human longs for. Communion is when you take something from your heart that's private, personal, and significant. Everybody say private, private. personal, private. significant. And I feed it to somebody else. Then they reach inside of their heart and they pull something out that's private, personal, and significant. And they feed it to me. That's what every human being wants. All the social media, Facebook, Instagram, it's all based on goodness. See how good I look. And you present the best version of you, which is scripted. That's what kills you. You know why it kills you? Because now I'm relating to the persona that you showed me publicly, but I'm missing fellowship with the person that you are privately. I'm missing fellowship with the person you presented to me publicly. Well, I guess that's who you are. But the real private person, I don't even know. And so you feel lonely. You could be in a crowd and be lonely. You could be in a church and be lonely because you're good. Well, I'm the good pastor's wife. I'm the good pastor's kid. I'm the good elder. I'm the good worshiper. Hey, 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 hey. God didn't want you to be good. He wants you to be you. 
You know, one of the most, most joyful things people tell me to me is when they say, Kevin, I've never met anybody else like you. I said, thank God. Why, that means I'm unique. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not a freak. You're just unique. And the fear of not fitting in is the power of goodness. The fear of rejection is the power of goodness. The fear of disqualification from the team or the group is the power of goodness. I will kill who I really am so you'll accept me. See how perverted that is? I will do all these good things so I'll be accepted. And here's the tragedy. If you live all that way to live for other people's expectations, when you finally get into a significant relationship like a marriage or a friendship or a church, you don't know how to be you. Learning how to be you takes a lifetime to learn. I would like to go to class on how to be me. No class. There's no class on how to be you. You see, you don't decide who you are. You discover who you are. You discover by doing. You discover by interactions. See, there's treasures inside of you and desires inside of you that God is excited for you to discover on the journey of your life. But if I'm so busy being good and trying to do for you and present to you how I think is going to make you happy, I lose sight of me. After Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves. Everybody say they hid themselves. See, the problem is if you hide yourself from God, you also hide yourself from you. I don't even know who I am now. I've been in hiding. Golden nugget. Treasure one-liner. You only grow in the light with reality-based conversations. If I'm not in the light and I don't have reality-based conversations, I can't grow. Some of you are stuck at the age 16 and 17 because that's when you went into hiding. I had a guy one time many years ago. He was one of those Hollywood movie star looking white guys. He was ripped. He was handsome. Man, he just, he had, he was a full package. He was articulate. He was 32 years old. I was working with him, but let him do the Lord. And as I began to disciple him, he had all these girlfriends that were 18 and 19 years old, but really they were so immature, they were like giggling like little bubble gummers. I said, man, let me ask you a question, brother. What connection do you have? You're 32, they're 18, and barely legal, dumb as a box of cheese. What do you have in common with these young girls? He says, I just get along with them. I just get along with them. And I began to do some investigation. I said, when did you start doing cocaine? He said, when I was 14. Now, cocaine was illegal. So if I'm doing something illegal, I have to do it in hiding. Connect the dots. If I have to do something that's illegal, sex things, drug things, whatever it is, I go into the dark. You know how come he liked girls that were 18, that were not mature? Because he was only 14 or 15 because he never grew as a person. He did not have reality-based conversation because he was in the darkness. He was hiding from himself. And when he went in public... He would present the good side of him, not the real side of him. God doesn't want you to be good. And some of you are deathly afraid of rejection. You're deathly afraid that you're not going to be accepted for who God made you to be. So you give us a substitute. That's what Adam and Eve did. They put on fig leaves. They put fig leaves on their private parts. And why is that significant? They can't reproduce their life if it's covered up. And God is saying today, let me take you into the light. It's painful if you've been hiding for a long time. It's a journey if you haven't had conversations with yourself that are reality-based. 
you may lose a lot of old friends. But those old friends, quote unquote, were relating to you based on your good, not, not based on who you are. And when you begin to act who you really are, you're going to find new people. You're going to find, let's see, this culture makes you think if you're not super attractive, you can't find love. I got a prophetic word for you. Ugly people can find love. <laughs> Heavy people can find love. Short people can find love. Why? It's not based on the outside. It's based on the inside. And many times you'll see somebody that's very plain looking with somebody very stunning like a beautiful girl or a handsome a man. And you always ask the question, how did he get her? Has anybody ever said that? Man. Has she got myopic vision or what? How? Did he get her? Apparently, she saw something inside that she liked. How many understand that when you're around people for a long time, when you first meet, you're like, man, you're this, you're that physically. But after you get to know them, right, you don't even see their physical anymore. You don't even notice it. Why? Their spirit is who I connected to. That's the kingdom, guys. You know, there are people in Jubilee that before I was a Christian, I would have never, ever hung out with you. You were not my tribe, not my flavor. We had nothing in common. But in Christ, man, we can be friends. We can be connected. Because it's about the inside, not the outside. Now, why is this so important? For you to have success in the one life that you have, God has arranged to bless you, not the persona that you want to present to the world. God doesn't want you to be good. And I know some of you, you're in shock. This is Jubilee. You're supposed to make a lot of noise when I preach. <coughs> oh, we're halfway Pentecostal, black, brown. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah. But it's so quiet here. Because I hit the bullseye. And the religious refugees are coming. I'm going to tell on you, Gina. David and Gina are my wife's cousins. David's her cousin. Gina's her cousin by marriage. And they've been here like three years. And Gina came up to me. She says, Kevin, I, I just feel so disconnected at Jubilee. I said, really? You know why? She had been in the religious box for how many years were you in that denomination? Three, th th three decades. So when she came to a church, she was more used to have a relationship with the box than the people in the box. And so when you're in that denomination, you connect the people, you join a group. Your relationships around that group activity rather than here I am. Let me be your friend. It was based on work and goodness. And so she's here. She goes, I don't feel connected. Why? She has the persona. She never let us see who she was. And God is saying, he doesn't want you to be good anymore. He doesn't want you to be good. He wants you to be that son and that daughter. Come here, Gina. Come here. Just take the microphone and say, God, I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be your daughter, Gina. God, I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be your daughter, Gina. Say it again. God, I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be your daughter, Gina. God, I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be your daughter, Gina. My name is Gina, and I need friends. The real Gina needs friends. The real Gina needs friends. Will you guys be my friends? You guys be my friends? <laughs> Give me here, Becky Youngblood.
Come here. Take the microphone. I say, I don't want to be good anymore. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Becky. I want to be Becky. I don't want to be good anymore. I don't want to be good anymore. I don't want to hide anymore. I don't want to hide anymore. I want to be Becky. I want to be Becky. Okay, you can be seated. If you struggle with this spirit about being good, it didn't have to be in church. If you had a formalistic, legalistic father, whether he was a Christian or not, you could be under the auspices of goodness. Children of alcoholics, rageaholics, they learn if I'm good, I don't wake up the monster. The rule of alcoholic children is don't think, don't ask, don't talk. You may wake up the monster. So I'm just good. Rageaholics, alcoholics, drug addicts. Man, it tells you just be good. No friction. Nothing will blow up. If you're here today and you know the Lord is talking to you. Now here's the problem with altar calls like this. If you feel I have 100% dysfunction, then I'll hang. No, no, I'm, I'm with the people that are 10%. 20%, you've been living for good. Why? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of leaven, a little bit of miscalculation messes up everything. If that's who you are, that you say, man, I've got this thing, formalism, legalism, working in my life, forcing me to be good as a personality, not who I am. I want you to stand to your feet right now. If we got, do we have a keyboard player here at all? Yeah, go ahead. There's a couple of more, man. Come on, Blondie. I don't want to be good anymore. And just say, I want to be, and then say your name. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be amity. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be amity. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be amity and authentic and real every time. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. If you're standing up, get in line. It won't take long. Come on. Get in line right now. There's something powerful about this kind of declaration. Come on, say it. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Sierra. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Sierra. I don't want to live by formulas anymore. I want to be Sierra. Deliver me from religious thinking. Deliver me from being good. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Tawana. Say it again. I don't want to be good anymore. I don't want to hide. I don't want to hide. Okay. Go hug your husband. Come on. I don't want to be good no more. I don't want to be Savannah. I don't want to be good no more. I want to be Savannah. How old are you, hon? Huh? Let's make a break today. Come on. I don't, I don't want to be good anymore. I just want to be Anika. Come on, I don't want to be good anymore. I just want to be Anika. <laughs> Come on, come on, give her a hug, come on. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Brian. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Brian. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Brian. You have a 
have a cameraman back here. Is it, is it running? Yeah, let's, let's have somebody track it. Just be cool. Let's go here. Loud. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Kim. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Kim. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to live. I want to be God's daughter. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Amber, God's daughter. Ooh, I'm so thankful for this conference. My dad was a rageaholic, and I had to be perfect to keep him off of me. And I do not want to be perfect. And I want to be God's son, and I want to be loved by him. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Stephanie. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be me. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Stephanie. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Haley. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Haley. 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 I don't want to be good anymore. called me to be. I want to be the man he, he chose me to be in, in my mother's womb, Lord. I don't want to be good no more. I want to be Jerome. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Jerome. Mm. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be LaShonda. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be LaShonda. I want to be who God says I am. Thank you. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Michael. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Michael. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Michael. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be the orchard. I do not want to be good. I want to be the orchard. I want to be who God called me to be. I don't want to be good. I don't want to be religious. I want to be who he called me to be. 
I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Deborah. Father God, I thank you that I don't have to be good to be your daughter. I don't have to be good to be your daughter. I don't have to be good for you to love me and accept me. I don't want to be good. I want to be Deborah. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Paco. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Paco. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Janae. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Janae. I don't want to live a lie anymore. I want to be Janae. I want to be your daughter, God. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Janae. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Sheila. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Sheila, Lord God. God, I thank you, Lord God. I just want to be the person that you have called me to be, God. And I ask God that you just stand up in me, God. Oh, God, I don't want to be good anymore, God. I want to be Sheila. Thank you, Lord God. want to be Nadia. I don't want to be good anymore. I just want to be Nadia. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be Ron. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be the man that God intended me to be. I don't want to be good anymore. I want to be wrong. Father, we just pray over every single person that came up here. God, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you put like a Teflon shield around them, God. So other people's opinions, other people's expectations, God, Lord, it just bounces off of these incredible men and women that came up here, God. Lord, we pray, we take authority, Father God, over unrealistic expectations, God, of other people. Lord, our desire is only to please you and you alone, God. So today, God, we thank you, Father God, there's been a shift that, God, we are not, Lord, we're not needy for other people's opinions. God, we're not needy, God, for other people's affirmations, God. We're not needy, God, to understand people's expectations of us. But something on the inside of us, God, has shifted, God. That, Lord, as long as I'm a son or a daughter, God, and my heart pleases you, that's all that really matters. That's all, Father God, that we live for today, God. And we declare, Father God, there has been a shift, God, over our minds, our heart, our emotions. And we speak, come on, we speak to our emotions right now. They, they will not be... Um, they will not be tempted. They will not be like a puppet. But God, they'll be led by you, and they'll be subjected to my spirits. My emotions will no longer, my emotions no longer will pull me this way and that way and up and down. But God, I thank you, Father God, my spirit is in control. Come on, declare that. My spirit man is in control. My spirit man is bigger. Than what I feel, than what I see, than what I, Lord, than what I go, my spirit man. So we speak to our spirit man to rise up, to be strong, to be whole, to be healed, and to be bigger than what my emotions tell me to do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm telling you, that's the single biggest thing is people's expectations amen people's expectations of you and I it's the single biggest thing that drags us like a like a like an earring in our nose it just pulls us this way and pulls us that way and I'm telling you, that's being broken over us as a house amen it's being broken over each and every one of us come on let's stand to our feet one more time Are you gonna sing something <laughs>
Well, come on, let's just shoot our hands high in there. How's that? Come on, let's just you give them some worship uh, today. Just before we take a, just before we shut down for the day. Father, we just love you this morning, God. God, we love you, Father. Oh, you're worthy, God. Oh, you're worthy, God. Oh, come on, just worship them. Come on, you use your own voice. Oh, you're good, God. Oh, you are good, God. Oh, you're good, God. You're good, Lord. You are good. You are good. Oh, we love you, Jesus. And your mercy is forever. You're good, Lord. You're good. You are good to us. You are good. Your mercy is forever. Woo! Praise God. Well, I sure am glad I came this morning. Come on, give your give God a big hand this morning. Or today, I guess. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Come on, love on some folks. We'll see you tonight. Seven o'clock. Don't miss it. It's gonna be awesome.